Okay, so what's the question? My question is that last time. Okay, guys, everybody else be quiet, please. Session 8, you were explaining the concept of given and taken. Yeah, given and taken. Yeah. yeah. So I am not clear with that. You gave an example of the chalk still yeah. in my mind and also transaction costs. Two things, yes. transaction costs and given and taken. Yes. Okay. All right. So let's just take a market which is sli uh, slightly dead, which so that it, the prices don't keep changing. So we'll take the example of Tesla. Okay. So suppose I'm just going to put a insert a row here so that we can look at the Tesla price. Okay. So assume that the Tesla bid and offer is 68.99. So if you're a, uh, now the market maker is quoting these prices, right? So if you want to buy from the market, if you want to uh, transact, let me use a more general expression, transact will include both buying and selling. If you want to transact in Tesla shares, okay, so if you want to sell uh, at which price, we will only talk about the, the decimals, okay, the cents, okay, we're not going to talk about that because the dollars is the same. 259 both sides okay. so we'll only talk about the sense that the price is 68.99 so if i if i'm a if i'm a price taker i'm a customer and i want to trade i will and if i want to sell at which price will i have to sell 68 yes you're clear about that is everyone clear yes, that you have to trade at 68 if i want to buy 99 everyone is clear yes, okay so this is how the market maker makes his money that hopefully he has a kind of over the long term he has a roughly half half distribution of sellers and buyers and then he picks up the spread and in an ideal situation the market price doesn't move at all and he has high volume so that's how you have the complete ideal conditions for a market maker where he makes the maximum money okay so this is why we are not calling them directional speculators because they're not really interested in directional movement okay so but they're still speculators because remember the Saroni had asked the question about whether market makers are arbitragers they're not yeah. because remember what is the test of a speculator what is how are we defined we have given a very precise definition of a speculator the first transaction will always increase the risk okay yes. and remember what we said that if you are behaving like a classical market maker you have to go home square yes. which means you should have no positions okay no market risk left on your book so when you go home you go home square and then the next morning when you come in your first transaction will always increase your risk yes. so i'm a tesla market maker kushbu comes and sells me five million shares immediately i am getting hit on my bid because she has to sell me on my bid she has to sell to me on my bid I'm the market maker, my bid is 68, my offer is 99, okay? So she has to sell to me on my bid, but what has happened? I started with the all cash balance sheet, balance sheet. On the asset side, I had all cash early in the morning, before the market opened, as soon as the market opens, she comes and gives me on my bid. So she gives me 5 million shares. So then now I have a position, okay? Now I have uh, exposure, okay? I have market risk. So the first transaction has increased my risk. So that's why I'm still a speculator, although I'm not a directional speculator, because I don't rely on directional movement to make money. Okay, unlike the other kind of trade where I showed you where, let's say in that example that we had, where I was buying shares of TCS. Right, so here uh, I'm speculating on directional movement because I bought it somewhere here and obviously since I bought it I'm expecting it to go a lot higher so above 2285 etc <coughs> make new highs okay because I'm buying that means I think that the uptrend is still intact okay and if the uptrend is still intact what is the definition of an uptrend higher, higher highs and higher lows okay so that's why you see that I put we are going into a different topic right now but actually I'm just refreshing some stuff okay and that's why I uh, obviously you know immediately that my minimum expectation is for a price higher than the highest high so far because if I'm saying that the uptrend is not complete that means it has to keep on moving in, in that same direction to complete before it can complete right so therefore it will and since the definition of an uptrend is higher highs it has to make a higher high okay so that's my minimum expectation and my stock was placed over here at the previous low because if it goes below this then the higher lowest condition is violated right and that's why my uh, stop is here i'm just coming to you garvin one second so fully answering uh, first answering kushpu's question i've gone into a little bit of a detour because we wanted to uh, recap that i think then we're having problems with the strength of the internet connection okay so we'll just imagine that there's a 68 and a 99 here under the bid and ask okay 
So, your question was about given and taken and transaction cost. Transaction cost. Okay, so given and taken essentially is what a market maker says. So, if I say the moment you sell uh, sell me 5 million shares, okay, at 68, I say that uh, Kushbu gave me 5 million shares or I was given 5 million at 68. So, that's what I'd say, okay. Given me, that was given to me, so now I have it, which means it's increased my long position. Taken is the opposite on the other side, on the offer side, okay. So, if somebody comes and buys from me, okay, if somebody comes and buys 7 million shares from me at 99, okay, that's my offer, then I'll say that I was taken at 99 for 7 million. That's the lingo that people will use, okay. So, this is just market jargon, but you have to be familiar with it and it makes sense also that taken means it's taken from me. So, I don't have whatever was taken from me. So, the position has gone down because I've actually sold it, okay. All right. So, uh, is this clear now? Transaction cost is what we said is that the bid offer transaction cost essentially is the economic concept of transaction cost I already told you, right? Yeah. That whether you're looking for a job or you're looking for a new house to stay in, at some point of time you just get fed up, okay? And you say that, okay, how many houses am I going to look at? If you look at 15 houses and you're not finding the best house, then you eventually basically just lower your standards or whatever and you just take the next one and let's get it over with, okay? Because you can't afford to keep on looking like that. It's the same thing with a job as well, okay? So these are called in, econo in economics, uh, this is the economic concept of transaction costs, okay, of trying to find the perfect solution, right. In the markets, we have a more specific definition of transaction cost, which is essentially what if you imagine that you in, uh, immediately bought and sold the same thing, okay. If you immediately buy and sell the same thing, essentially you have a, let's try and get to that part of our note. I hope my browser is not hanging. Everything is malfunctioning today. See, it's not even going to that page where we have the notes. Okay, we'll just have to try and admit that some particular tab is happening. Okay, whatever it is, we'll have to just deal with it. Okay, so transaction costs in the markets, we have a more specific view of transaction costs. Okay, so we use the bid offer spread as one good proxy of transaction costs. So you imagine as if you are instantly buying and selling the same asset. So if you have a uh, very wide bid offer spread, then you'll end up losing a lot of money. Okay. So that's why we say the transaction cost is high in that particular market. So one index of transaction cost is the spread of the bid off, uh, the bid offer spread, the size of the bid offer spread. Okay. So we have a more specific view of transaction cost in the market. Okay. In financial markets. And of course, the other aspect of course is the, it's connected to the idea of liquidity. Okay. Later on, hopefully today this, the net connection is so bad that, um, given how bad this is I should try management one more time all right so it's also connected to the idea of liquidity that you know eventually the you know how many uh, how many uh, uh, what price do you get relative to the market price that you saw initially when you tried to get in okay uh, but that's a less precise view of transaction cost the good way to look at transaction costs which keeps it specific in the financial market context is to look at the size of the bid offer spread okay and so that's why we said if you saw that in the class previous class we made this argument that uh, in the class previous class we were talking when i was talking about economic policy okay where you have too much regulation and for instance in india you have the experience that we have a very poor view of speculators so we are always trying to curb speculation but we miss the point that speculations as uh, speculators add liquidity okay and speculators add liquidity and what they do is eventually the impact of that is that the bid offer spread becomes tighter so that people who are using the market like Tata Motors wants to do some foreign exchange transaction, okay? If they want to use the market, they're not a foreign exchange speculator, they're a hedger, okay? But if they have some royalties coming in from Europe, they need to sell those, okay? If they want to do a foreign exchange transaction. So all these market users, like the commercial corporates and the normal people, 
who go uh, who want to transact in foreign exchange for whatever reason okay all the users of the market for them there is a benefit from speculation because speculation lowers the transaction costs by adding liquidity so more and more players come in they try to compete for business okay and therefore that brings down the spreads the bid offer spread this is clear so far everybody's clear about transaction costs bid offer spread okay so we use the transaction cost as an index of the bid offer spread okay all right so is this clear so far your answers your questions okay yes garvin now what is your question okay, sir, my question was that okay, give him the mic yeah uh, hello yeah sir, my question was that uh, when i'll be selling you the shares uh, of tesla of 5 million dollars yeah so the price uh, of tesla shares would be decreasing first part and the second part was will you uh, for uh, for making zero position will be, you will be decreasing the ask price or not whether i'll decrease the ask price okay good question very good question so the response to the first part of your question is that you have assumed that just because you have sold me 5 million shares the bid will reduce okay that's not necessarily uh, the case going to be the case all the time you can't actually predict what will happen because it all depends on the uh, other factors in the market okay so but in general you're right that if you are providing excess supply to the market it uh, ceteris paribus it should drive the price down okay uh, so that's correct but in the real in the real world of course there's never any ceteris paribus because there's all kinds of other dynamic going on right so uh, yeah so in that sense uh, you're partly right and partly wrong but in real in the real world you should not expect it to go down all the time the second thing is that okay what are we well so the second question that he had asked is a very good question which is that if i as a market maker i've been given five million shares okay uh what do i want to do you know in terms of uh, you know uh, how do i want to manage this risk and he's asking whether as a result of being given five million shares whether i will reduce my ask price which is 99 okay so what is the motivation here it depends on uh, ideally what i would want to do as a market maker is not keep a very big position okay but market makers do take very short term views on what's going to happen in the market very short term means in the sense like one minute two minute three minute kind of views okay how markets will move in that time so but assuming that this guy wants to but he is hinting at a very interesting motivation that we should look at which is that what is one way for him to because what does he want to do he's he doesn't really want to keep a position he just wants to make a bid off a spread because he's not a specul uh, directional speculator okay so he wants to really get rid of this very quickly so one of the ways in which he can uh, get rid of this position now remember now his position is long so to get back to a square position what does he have to do he has to sell or to buy he has to sell okay so if he has to buy he has to sell what does the price taker have to do no not bid if, if he has to sell like somebody like others is saying i think that the price taker has to buy if the market maker wants to sell what he wants the price taker to do is to buy because if the price taker buys then he will be selling okay please practice these concepts these are not very complicated concepts but you're hearing them for the first time and they're technical so you need to just practice it and rehash it in your mind until it's very clear and then once you get it very clear then it, uh, you'll never forget it in your life otherwise you'll keep having problems who is selling what is the base asset you're selling the base asset therefore buying the base asset who is the seller who's the buyer? i mean who's the market maker who's the price taker so it can get a little confusing but there's nothing to get confused if you go step by step and you rehash the concepts okay so so remember the motivation of the market maker he wants to get rid of the position okay he wants to therefore his position is long to get rid of it he'll have to sell to, okay so if he wants to sell then the if he's going to have to sell then the mark price taker will have to buy right so now the price taker now think about the motivation for why uh, garbit was saying that that uh, what will incentivize the price taker to buy because i have to incentivize the customer right so uh, what will intend if the price the, if the offer is at 99 right now okay the customer is looking at a price of 99 to buy so how can i uh, if i want to incentivize the customer to buy should i lower this price or raise this price i should lower the price okay so what he's asking essentially is part of the motivation could have been for his asking this is that what how do you get rid of the position that you lower the bid uh, you lower the offer you lower the ask and you make it 19 tighten your price and make it 97 okay or 98 
So if you have a 98, now the customer who was not, who was looking at the prices, maybe there was a customer who's looking at the prices and he's looking at 99 and he's not really happy. I don't want to buy at 99, but if I get 97, I'll buy. Okay. So that guy, when he, once he sees the 97, he will come in and buy. So what have you got? And assuming that he buy, he's buying the same volume of shares. Okay. What have you got now? You've got your zero position back because you sold, you bought 5 million and now you've sold 5, uh, 5 million. Is this clear? You sold 5 million at 97. You bought 5 million at 68. So you have made that bid offer spread and by adjusting the bid offer spread a little bit, you have managed to get rid of your position. So this is how market makers sort of shade that we call the shading the prices. Okay. So they shade the prices a little bit here and there, partly based on their very short term market view and partly based on what they want to do. Okay. So if I already have a large long position, I want to get it. Uh, I want to get rid of some of it. I might actually show a better offer than what is available in the market right now. So that's how another reason how uh, another factor that drives uh, the movement in the bid offer spreads. Is everyone clear? Okay. Does it answer your question, Garvin? Okay. So, but in general, you can't always expect because if there's maybe there is a tremendous amount of buying pressure in, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, there's a lot of bids in the market. Okay. In that case, the price may not move down. So, but we, uh, the, uh, you will stop the bid if everyone is um, buying and you will stop the bid price. I won't stop. I won't stop. I will also increase my bid because if essentially what will happen is that overall, uh, you know, these two kind of will remain more or less together, the bid and offer. If everyone is buying, then the sellers, the market makers will keep raising their offer prices. Okay, because there's excess demand and they also remember the guys who are getting short, the market makers who are getting short, if there's excess demand generally in the market. Okay, although you came and sold. But let's say the general market situation is excess demand at that point of time. Okay, market makers look at very short term horizons. Okay, two minutes, three minutes kind of very short term horizons, especially in the active markets like the euro and things like that. Okay, uh, euro, dollar, yen, etc. So uh, these guys looking at very short term horizons. If in that horizon, if there is excess excess demand generally in the market, even though you have sold, what's happening is because there is excess demand from customers, the market makers in general assume that there's only one market maker. Okay, just for the sake of simplicity, that guy is then getting net short because everybody is buying from him. If the customers are in a buying mood, then he everyone is buying from him and he's getting net short. Okay, so he wants to reduce his net short position. He wants to buy some. How will you reduce your net short position by buying some? Okay, and how will you incentivize if you have to buy? That means customers should sell to you. And what should you what should you do to your bid price? Uh, if you, you you should increase your bid price, then the, it's more attractive for the customer to sell, right? So that's how the bid goes up. If there's an excess demand, so it will tend to push the price up from both sides. Okay. So yeah. So Cetris Paribus, your statement was correct. The first part of your uh, statement, uh, and the second part also, if the prices remain, if the bid offer spread remains the same. Uh, constant but now we're in this situation we should no longer think of Cetris Paribus that should be an exceptional kind of uh, situation that we consider just to understand uh, just to see whether you understand the way the impact will be okay but in general in the market you'll find there is no Cetris Paribus because everything is always changing okay that's the problem yeah 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 um, you said that on 99 uh, he will reduce the price to 97 and then he'll sell the whole 5 million more so how about you give, give, give her the mic yeah yeah i got the first part so at night at 97 so the guy has been given at 5 million at 68 and now he wants to get rid of it get rid of it so he reduces instead of having a market offer of 99 he shows a better offer of 97 and then some customer who's waiting on the sidelines and finds 97 attractive comes and buys from him at 97 so he's taken at 97 and the position is squared and he's made 68 and 97 the difference between that on 5 million shares yeah so how about if he instead of selling the whole 5 million he will sell only half of it or some portion of it and then find another customer and sell it on higher price yeah he can do that see that's where it's his short term view uh, comes into the picture so generally market makers are always running trying to run a square book because they don't really want to take a position but they do take short term views very short term views like 2 minute 3 minute 5 minute okay sometimes maybe a little longer depends on the market maker but ideally in a market making uh, uh, you know when you're running a market making book you should not be running large positions because your goal is really to pick up the spread 
uh, by keeping a more or less uh, square book so he can do that that depends on a short term view if he feels that in the short term the price will uh, go up a little bit more there is so the market maker has to have a very good sense of what is the pressure in the market the short term very short term market pressure okay especially in actively traded markets like euro dollar yen you'll see that even the oil price and the gold price if you look at these markets they're very actively traded okay and these are globally traded markets so you can get a very, very actively traded so the market maker will have a view that's why i said remember anything that why is the whole uh, set of finance selectives heavily focused on financial markets because no matter what kind of job you do whether you're a corporate uh, treasurer a cfo or whether you're a market maker or you're an asset manager everywhere you go to the ro I mean, when you examine the roles you'll find that in their day-to-day -day decision making they have to take views on markets so here also coming to your question he could do that that all depends on his view on the market in this case because he's a market maker he has a very short term horizon so he'll have a sense of uh, you know which way the market is likely to move okay so based on that if he feels that the market is likely there seems to be some buying pressure in the market short term then he won't sell off the entire 5 million he will show an offer of 97 only for maybe 2 million and then he'll keep the balance 3 million because he thinks the short term movement will take the price up a little bit then he'll sell it at a higher price so sir it will differ from situation to situation it's not necessary that he will always because yeah. the time horizon is short so it's not necessary that he will always square off the whole position not necessarily it depends on his view depends on his market view but in general as a market maker you don't want to keep a large position for very long because that's not the nature of the business okay clear okay has everyone understood that's one of the reasons why i told you that in this uh where I, the reason one of, one of the reasons why i told you that uh, you should uh, practice forming views on markets okay so remember this what did i do i just basically uh, this is the question that aurora was asking how did you that we we'll get to yet we, we we haven't got to that question yet how did you decide when you were looking at the stock of tcs how, why did you decide to buy instead of sell okay so that the answer to that question is a very long answer okay but at the moment i have told you that this is and this is a totally legitimate method okay eventually you will find that there is no clear cut this is not a science okay it's not like designing a mars rover or something where you know if you get all the theoretical parts right it has to go and land on the on mars there's no other way because if you have understood the physics and your design is okay and the parts are not faulty it has to go and land on mars okay so here it's not like that here you don't know what's going to happen and no matter what kind of uh, sophisticated quantitative method you use it's not going to it's not guaranteed to work uh, in the long term okay so therefore it's quite reasonable to uh, just develop a feel for the market right every human being can do that we are natural uh, we are natural at recognizing we are naturals at recognizing patterns so what i told you essentially was so the short answer and the simple answer to aurora's question is how did i how did i decide to buy and not to sell well i looked at this and i saw that this high is actually higher than this high so this seems to be a long term uptrend okay in the stock of tcs and i just made an assumption that this long term uptrend is not yet over okay which means therefore it's going to keep on making higher highs and higher lows okay so therefore obviously it's going to go higher than this so then obviously in this kind of a situation where the price is here i will actually buy if you remember the way we were looking at the price that day when we first looked at the price when we first look at tcs uh, tcs price the other day we actually saw that uh, that price was falling quite sharply if you look at that demonstration video that i've shared with you guys the price was actually falling quite sharply so i thought that okay maybe we should based on that kind of short term price action you would be inclined to sell but then when i looked at the chart it seemed to me like this is actually a long term uptrend so that's how you change uh, the view okay so you get some kind of uh, idea of how you can take these decisions but for the moment uh, you can just try to adopt this approach just look at the chart and try to develop a feel for it where do you think this chart is going just like if i take uh, if i took you to to a beach and just gave you a surf button without any lessons i just told you to surf you would find some way to learn eventually you would find figure out how to learn you would see the patterns you would adjust your behavior right in the same way you can just feel very confident about looking at the charts and forming a view okay what is really important here is the second part of what i did if you remember that i placed a stop over here 
if you get the risk management right this method is absolutely legitimate okay there's nothing wrong with this method it may seem to you like we are doing something like voodoo or whatever okay like witchcraft or something that they were not very serious investors but that's not true this is a very very scientific method but what is really important is what i did here that because i said that my view was that okay the subtrend is not over which means it should have higher highs and higher lows so higher highs tells you that i'm expecting a minimum move above 2300 okay but the stop where did i why did i place the stop over here because this is the highest low so far okay so the stop is here because the stop is meant to take me out of my position okay it's meant to cancel out my position and why should i cancel out my position over here because the position is taken on the assumption that the uptrend is still intact okay so there should be continuing uh, continuing pattern if i'm right there should be a continuing pattern of higher highs and higher lows but if the market goes below this then the higher low part of it is destroyed because you made a low lower than this low so it's no longer a higher low if it remains here so far and uh, you know eventually goes up then this will become the low which is valid because this is higher than this low is everyone following yes, sir. maybe we can set it out like this now you see this low where i set my stop if this thing actually eventually moves up then it this would have become the next low and this low will be higher although it's very close but it's still technically higher than this low everyone can see that yes. okay so that means that my stop would not be triggered and we would maintain the and eventually if it goes about 2300 makes a new high we would have maintained the pattern of higher highs and higher lows which means my view would have been correct proved correct okay so my view is proved correct so therefore i should remain in the position on the contrary if it had gone below this that's why the stop was placed here if it had gone below this that means this rule of higher lows is being violated the test of higher lows is not satisfied because you made a new low lower than this low is everyone following the logic yes. okay very important to follow this logic because it's a it give this gives you a very simple way to approach markets and it's a perfectly legitimate method and if you apply good risk management uh, this is a very safe system much better than all the garbage that most investors are following by listening to tips and listening to somebody's views some brokers views and buying stuff and then like what you guys have done you didn't even plan your stop before you entered okay so these are all unprofessional approaches to uh, amateur approaches to investing so the most important aspect of this is the stop and the position sizing which we will come to later but the idea of the stop itself gives you the idea of risk management that fine i made a bet on this particular view that this tcs stock uh, trend is still intact okay but you see that i'm not very worried because uh, my risk is quite limited okay so you have to make sure that you uh, this is a very uh, important aspect of trading and if you can get this right you can trade just using this method just like as if you're surfing the waves okay you don't even need to know what tcs does maybe you think tcs is a pizza chain or something like that it doesn't matter because you are as long as you stick to the liquid stocks okay and as long as you have good risk management this is what uh, that's all you need okay so uh, so as everyone clear so far okay so we came to this i don't know why i came to this but i, I keep coming back i have repeated this logic uh, many times but it's important you need to understand this logic but if you get this part right uh, this is very so this is a very solid and simple method okay so where were we why did i come to this discussion i started talking about aurora's question um no no but tcs itself i came to from um maybe i was coming maybe i was trying to distinguish between market makers and uh, directional speculators okay so essentially the idea yeah i was talking to you about how in any finance role any finance role that you look at you are going to have to take views on markets that's what i was saying so the market maker also has to have a view to really make a lot of money for himself to really maximize his profits okay he has to have a short term view on the markets which way the pressure is going and even the directional speculator has to have a view okay so directional speculator good example is any mutual fund your hcfc mutual fund the guys what they are doing is directional speculation the guys who are making markets like ib has a market making group ib is attractive brokers okay uh, they have a market making group i think it's called uh, timber hill securities or whatever so their job is just to make markets okay market making is a very big business there are many major hedge funds like citadel group also has a very big 
market making arm that market making division only makes markets they don't really speculate big time on directional movements they are trying to just make markets and pick up very high volume and pick up the bid offer spread on very high volume okay in and out of the market so if you look at the total volume on a market making desk it will be huge okay but this the profits are very profits per share are very small very small profits very high volumes okay so uh, that's the idea of this so th this is the point this is why the whole set of finance selectives is heavily focused on financial markets you will not find this kind of focus in any other business school because uh, it doesn't uh, the design of the curriculum is not driven by these considerations okay so that's why you need to get really immersed in financial markets that's why you need to follow the instructions that i've given you i hope you guys are all watching tv regularly are you practicing that because these are all important you have to follow all the instructions then only will you get the required results okay so like next week we have a very big meeting coming coming up for the US Federal Reserve the US Federal Reserve is very important because the most important central bank in the world they essentially set the level of global interest rates whatever they are doing everybody else is uh, kind of more or less constrained to follow okay so try to follow that debate and you can actually look at this maybe i should just take this this is another thing that you guys should look at i'm going to put it into your uh, session outline just with all this Okay. So if you look at this, this is something else and as you're following the markets, this is another element of following the markets. You will find that Indians, Indian data is also covered. This is a very useful way for you guys to learn. Again, this is outside the curriculum. Okay. You have to do this on your own. Like there's a lot of stuff which I'm showing you. We don't have time to cover it formally in the curriculum. Okay. But these are all pointers that I'm giving you and you have to take this lead and, and and run with the ball and do it yourself is this clear okay so you can see indian pmi does everyone know what pmi is mark purchasing managers index okay pmi you don't need to write it down because you have this link when you click on i and pmi so thursday tomorrow i not tomorrow i'm looking at next week actually i'm looking at next week because it's july 29 okay lead you don't need to write it down because you get you have the link and you can click on it and see it okay but maybe if you write it down it'll you'll remember it better okay purchasing managers index is a very important type of data so the pmi is you'll see us pmi you'll see eurozone pmi you'll see Jap uh, japanese pmi singapore pmi okay so purchasing managers index is one kind of data that comes out very important data okay so you can read about it all this stuff is given to you okay so you can learn a lot from this follow this on a regular basis and you can learn a lot from it because why investors care all this is learning for you from for you guys okay and if you don't understand something then you can ask me all right but you have to do this on your own all right so as you follow the markets one of the things you follow uh, is so pmi is essentially what we call soft data this part you can write down pmi is essentially survey data okay pmi comes from a purchasing manager survey all right so consumer sentiment is also another example of survey data so you call up all the consumers how are you feeling about the economy are you optimistic about your job prospects this blah 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 all these is all survey data you understand what survey is yes you call up people here you're calling purchasing managers and companies and there you're calling customers and asking for their how do they feel about the economy consumer sentiment all this kind of survey data in the financial markets we call it soft data okay soft data is distinguished from today is 24 okay pmi cc is consumer confidence okay so pmi etc this is basically soft data so this is financial market lingo once again but you should know about all this okay because there is some logic to it and hard data is essentially what do you think will be hard data like you want to take a guess you know all the kinds of data like when you look at this chart when you look at this uh, let's go back to um, let's go back to this week uh, or we can stay here Done. you'll see a lot of data here can anybody see you see what's happening here this is the layout of this what's coming on monday what's coming on tuesday all the stuff you can see which country's stuff are being released okay all this
you see a lot of PMI data is coming okay what is this do you think this is hard data or soft data Japanese unemployment rate hard data okay very good so all this stuff like industrial production GDP okay uh, consumer price index okay these uh, unemployment rate this is all hard data because it's taken from actual observations okay survey data is okay how are you feeling you know are you optimistic about your job prospects these are all kind of vague answers you might get okay they try to make it better but it's still kind of unreliable so this is called hard data okay so all this stuff is hard data this is another term that you need to understand okay so I'm just gonna write um, uh, not GBP but GDP okay industrial production okay these are etc these are hard data okay and these are soft data so another thing that you need to do as part of your learning as following the um, following the markets ahead if you're really going to be thorough about it ahead of the week coming out okay uh, on the weekend itself you should survey this and see what's coming up next week some of these discussions happen in the TV pro on, on TV as well what's coming up next week like one of the important things that's coming up next week is you can see this where is that yeah US FOMC meeting announcement if you want to read about this you can click on this FOMC stands for what Federal Open Market Committee okay so FOMC is like our MPC our monetary policy committee the FOMC for uh, again I think we have a net problem but we won't worry about this at the moment so anyway so this is another pointer that is given to you okay in the nature of these are all pointers okay this stuff that you have to follow on your own this will all improve there's a lot you can learn from just that Econoday website because you have all this data that comes out you can watch the market discussion on TV after the data comes out or better than that you can actually read the coverage on the Econoday website after the release has happened you will see how they've analyzed the release okay so you can see there's a lot of information there you can learn a lot <coughs> okay so let's go back to our um, uh, our um, flow okay are you guys feeling lost have we because we have discussed a couple of points which are outside the flow technically but are you I hope nobody's feeling lost okay so Um, I think we covered all this. Transaction dates versus settlement dates is obviously covered. Okay. Settlement risk is covered. Players are covered. Trading on codes. Okay. So this is the answer. When hit on bid offer, we say MM was given or taken. Okay. So all this stuff two-way prices this also we've covered competition among market makers this is what we covered the last time okay that in the foreign exchange markets now you can see that you have these super scripts seven and eight this has come from competition between market makers that was explained in the last class towards the end of the last class so we'll move on now I will add um, okay so the other important index of liquidity is the average volume traded in a market okay so we have another index of liquidity is um, bid offer spread is one important one and the average volume traded is another uh, important index of liquidity okay and liquidity you understand basically is just uh, the ability to move large volumes without impacting the price so if I can go and buy billions of uh, euros against the dollar and the price hardly moves okay if I buy let's say 5 billion against the euro at 44 and the price hardly moves maybe the offer goes to 44 half okay it goes to 44 half or it just goes to 45 then we say that the euro is a very liquid market because I've just bought 5 billion dollars and the price has hardly moved but if you look at a li less liquid market if you go and hit that market with a 5 billion dollar uh, buy the price will jump sharply okay so that's the difference between a, a liquid market and an illiquid market all right so uh, now the question that uh, Mittal was asking at the end of the last class which is essentially uh, this 
okay we have to learn a few other terms which is we have to understand what an order book is these two I'm just going to make sure that this is something as that will help you to follow the the uh, movement of uh, as markets we'll just spend a little bit of time on this and make sure that And in the meantime, I'll just copy these two links and put them in your... So this stuff is just being randomly pasted because this is just for your reference. What? What is hard data? Industrial production. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Very good. Yeah, because I just copied it from soft and I forgot to overwrite. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Very good uh, observation. Okay, good. So these two that you saw that we looked at, what are those here? Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so you see foreign exchange market trading hours. Okay, can you see this? Just uh, understanding this, if you mouse over this, you have the link. You can see that, what does it say? So it's not yet fully loaded, so it's not giving a message. So you can see now that London has not yet opened. Can you see that? Opens in two hours. London has not yet opened. New York also has not opened. This will open in seven hours. This will open in two hours. These two are open now, Sydney and Tokyo. But technically Hong Kong, Singapore is also open, but they're not showing that. Okay. So uh, you can see the, this is how it goes. So as there's a gap here, but you have other markets like Singapore, Hong Kong, Zurich making up Frankfurt, Zurich making up the, the gap here. So the market isn't actually dead. It's still there. Okay. So you have big centers like uh, Zurich, Frankfurt, Singapore, Hong Kong, which will remain open up until London comes in. Okay. All right. And there are certain banks which run night desks like Tokyo, big banks in Tokyo will have a night desk, which means those guys will be there like 24 into 5. Okay, so you'll see even during New York time and Tokyo, everybody else in Tokyo is sleeping. There'll be a bunch of guys like the Bank of Tokyo. Tokyo will have a night desk in foreign exchange. They, they could be dealing with New York, the, the banks which are open in New York. So the big banks in the major centers will run some night desk uh, operations, which cover all the, but that's not the normal operation. The rest of the rest of the Tokyo market will be closed. Okay, it will close in one hour, you can see. You can see that it's going to close in about an hour's time okay and here you can see another thing which is gives you a sense of how the markets move um, I don't know if you can still read can you still read not really so you can see how the mark Sun is moving from east to west so the market this visual is arranged in this manner okay can you see that so this link is also there you can see what the differences in times are because you need to know normally the markets in the big centers will open around uh, around 738 types sometimes it opens a little earlier but by 730 7 730 it's kind of open uh, especially in foreign exchange so this is how the market moves uh, you know the globally traded markets like gold oil um, foreign exchange okay these kind of gold silver also these markets are traded 24 hours and the US equities uh, futures markets which are open also 24 hours almost so uh, these things are traded globally and they uh, move around the and the markets keep moving like this so it, it gives you a sense of how global financial markets operate are you getting the idea here okay so I'm just gonna close this to reduce uh, looks like again it's hanging <coughs> Okay, so we seem to have lost the internet connection once again, but okay, let's just try and cover the um, let's just try and cover the the concept. Okay, the concept that I was trying to teach you was uh, it's not there right now. We'll cover it later on when once it comes in. So there's there are two new concepts that we are going to learn. Uh, yeah, one is the concept of a few concepts, order book. A concept of an order book and concept of top of the terms that we are going to learn are top of the book and market depth okay so what is top of the book and what is market depth so essentially what you see typically the prices that we were looking at for Tesla that we looked at 68 and 99 okay 
that those prices are the best typically most of the trading systems will display display to you the best bid and the best offer okay but in any market it's not necessary that there's only one bid and one offer okay there are a whole bunch of people who are showing their interests okay so uh, those but they if they don't have the best bid then their price is not shown uh, at the top of the book okay so it's like an iceberg when you see the iceberg you see only a little bit of the iceberg but underneath the water there's a whole bunch of stuff okay so there's actually a type of order here on the ib uh, system called uh, called iceberg orders if you go to the ib ib website you can explore that website also they have good information okay so um so the point we are seeing uh, we'll have to just imagine that the prices are there because it's not it's not responding so uh, let me just imagine this so you see 68 and 99 this is a uh, this is what we have okay this is called the top of the book okay assume that obviously in real in, in the real world when your markets are open in the us the tesla bid offer will not be so wide because it's quite actively traded but let's assume that it's 68.99 okay so that means 68 is the best bid of all the people who are bidding for shares of tesla the best bid is 68 and all the people who are selling uh, uh, all the people who are selling uh, looking to sell shares of tesla the best offer is 99 okay so best offer means uh, does it mean lowest offer or highest offer lowest offer okay because this is shown from the best bid and offer is uh, that statement is made from the perspective of the price taker okay so the best bid and offer we are learning a few terms which is one is the order concept of the order book and one is the concept of the um, uh, top of the book and then the concept of market depth okay so uh, so essentially i think i'm going to have to use the board now because uh, even my uh, thing is not here is, nothing is working so i'm going to use the board do we have yeah so let's assume that we have This session seems to be a total disaster from a technology point of view it's a total disaster okay so let's just assume that we have the shares of tesla okay so we're looking at the market for tesla here okay and then we have let's say um so we have this quantity and price and then we have quantity and price on the offer side okay so what will happen is let's say that there are people who are willing to sell 100 at uh, let's say not 99 but uh, we'll make it a little higher than that we have 100 shares and we are moving to the next uh, big figure that is over 99 so we say over at 05 then we have 200 at 05. and then we have 300 at 99 okay so this is moving higher this is going to the next big figure this is quantity okay this is not 300.99 this is just quantity okay and here we have uh, 68 is the price and let's say that we have uh, 300 at 68 then we have somebody looking to uh, buy 400 at 60 then somebody looking to buy 700 at 40 is everyone clear we are only talking about decimals okay so whatever that price was the big figure was i, I don't i think it was 279 or something so you got, you got to imagine here this 68 is 279.68 279.60 279.40 this is 279.99 and this is 280.02 is everyone clear what i'm showing yes sir okay right so now uh, what we have is so this is basically your order book obviously an actual order book in a, on an exchange is uh, much bigger so you have an exchange server where people are entering their orders all those who want to trade on this exchange they're entering their orders and in this particular case ib is actually aggregating orders from many uh, exchanges and values okay but we're, for the sake of simplicity we'll think of only one exchange and then we have all these orders okay so everyone is clear about these prices so here what is the best bid which is the first one 
40 is the best bid. Remember, best bid and best offer are uh, are uh, these terms are used from the perspective uh, with the implicit perspective being that of the price taker. So, if I'm the price taker, is the best bid? What is the best bid? Some are saying 40, some are saying 68. If I'm the price taker and if I'm looking to sell, I'll have to sell on what? Bid or offer? I'll have to. So 68 is the best bid because I, if I'm a seller, as a price taker, if I'm looking to sell, I'll have to sell on the bid. So essentially what I'm saying when we're asking the question of what is the best bid, we are asking the question of from the perspective of the price taker, which is the best selling price for him? Is the question clear? The best bid is 68 therefore, this is clear, best bid is 68, then what is the best offer? Very various views. <laughs> Again use the same logic. What is the best offer? Essentially if I'm talking about this best bid and best offer from the perspective of the price taker. Okay. These terms are best uh, are best bid and best offer. These terms are coined from the perspective of the price taker. So if the price taker is looking at the best offer, what does the price taker do on the offer? Does he sell or buy? He buys on the offer. So essentially another way of putting this question is what is the best bid? Another way of stating this question is what is the best buying price for the price taker? In this case it's 99 because this changes the big figure here from 99 is 279.99 this is 280.02. Is this clear? These are just the quantities. Is this clear? Is everyone following? Yes, Burma, you are clear? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, is this clear now? The concept of bed. So, what we are learning is that this is typically how and what, what an order Some other day we will get a chance to show you an actual order book. You can see it actually. On the uh, on your TWS, you can also see your order books and you do get order books even for the NSE. So, if you want to look at a stock like ITC, you want to see, you can just right click and I forget what the exact term is. But you will see market depth, either something that says market depth or order book, okay? That will show you the information. So this is the concept of an order book. It will sit on an exchange server, okay? Everybody understands what client server uh, system architecture, everybody understands? Yeah. The system has a server and whoever's trading with the system, they have a client machine, they connect to the server. Usually you go through the broker's machine also, yeah. okay? So, um, the broker, you enter the orders in a broker's machine and the broker connects to this, uh, the system exchange server. So here you see all these orders that have been entered by people who want to participate in the market. So some guy wants to buy 700 shares at 40. Some guy wants to buy 400 shares at 60. Some fellow wants to buy 300 at 68. Okay? And these guys are looking to sell at these prices. These are the quantities they want to sell and they are, these are the, uh, uh, the prices at which they want to sell. Okay? So that's why you see here, now um, you can see, so this is called, so this is the concept of an order book. An order book is just nothing but an arrangement of orders, okay, uh, showing the different prices and uh, prices at which different players are willing to buy or sell and the quantities associated with those prices, okay. So it is like a transactional intent that you can see here that I want to buy 700 shares at 40, this guy elected. Okay, so this is the concept of an order book. Is everyone clear now what is an order book? And so what you see here, this bid, best bid and offer is maybe we can just connect it this way somehow. Okay, so this is the best bid and offer. Okay, so the highest bid and the lowest offer. Okay, but don't memorize it this way. Try to understand best bid and offer is from the perspective of the price taker. So what we use, the terms that we use are best bid and offer. So in the US they have this term called NBBO, which is National Best Bid and Offer. So they have many, many platforms in the US. So the job of the broker is, uh, the broker has to give the customer an option to trade at the best, the best bid and offer. Okay, and they have to basically execute. When they're executing also, the broker has to make sure that he executes at whatever was at that point of time, the national N the NBBO, that is the National Best Bid and Offer. So if you give an order to IP to sell shares of Tesla, and 68 is the best bid at that time, he has to execute at 68. Okay, for as long as the quantity remains in place. Okay, maybe there are some people ahead of you in the queue. By the time your order gets here, the best bid has dropped, then it's fine, they can sell at the left. But whatever is the best bid at the time that you come to the top of the queue, 
that is the price at which your order has to be executed. Okay, if you are the first in line and you are selling only 300 shares, then IB has to uh, sell at 68 for you because there is a bid, there is a bid showing at 300 for 300 shares at 68. Is everyone clear? So order book concept is clear now. The best bid and offer concept is clear now. So the best bid and offer essentially is called the top of the book. Okay. So we use the expression top of the book to indicate the best bid and offer. Okay. So although actually it's technically the middle of the book. If you look at it, once you visually arrange the book, technically it's actually the middle of the book. But the expression we use in the market is the top of the book. Okay. So um, now uh, the the other expression that we use is market depth. Okay, market depth is nothing but because in the normal display, if you see what we were looking at in the normal display, we were just looking at the best bid and offer. We were looking at the top of the book. We are always looking at the two best prices. Yes. So normally the default display is only the top of the book. Okay, but if you want to see the market depth, like this is very useful for market makers because if they see like suppose these figures are much bigger, like suppose these figures there's like 60 at 67 there's like 5 million shares and then again at 6 this maybe, maybe this price is they may they see at 66 there's another 10 million shares so by looking at this you get an impression that the bid side is much heavier i mean there's much more volume on the bid side okay so by looking at things like normally people look at market depth to get a sense of the short term uh, balance in the market so if you see there are lots of heavy orders on the bid side very closely stacked in terms of price like the 68 300 shares only but 5 million at 67 uh, maybe 10 million at 66 okay and so on and so forth but here you don't see any change you see only this then you might conclude that the bid side there's more pressure on the bid side so you would look at this and you would conclude that in the short term the price is more likely to move up because there more, there's more buying pressure in the market you following what i'm saying so normally people look at market depth to all right so that was our uh, coverage of market depth why is this still not coming back okay at least this thing is not hanging anymore that okay so but i can't even go back to market depth is just a term that we use that you know so it's like if you say that if you are seeing uh, the top of the book if you are only seeing the top of the book okay now i might ask this question uh, because they have given you nse data permission this time with market depth but sometimes they don't like some exchanges will not give you market depth information unless you pay some extra money okay so you uh, your question was define market depth yes. yeah so what you would say to the exchange is okay this is you are only showing me the top of the book and for that you're charging hundred dollars a month for the data feed now if i want to see the market depth how much extra will i have to pay market depth essentially means that any point of time unfortunately the software is not working right now so again just because i touched it then again it's started not responding okay anyway so the point here is that maybe the men, uh, the right menu is also not going to work so i see only the bid and ask see here in the trading tools you should find this see you can launch this yourself if you go to uh, trading tools so i'm looking at this okay the way we use market depth is this then i look at the bid and ask size okay but this is only the top of the book and then i say okay i want to see the can i see the market depth as well okay Okay, could I see the market depth as well? You just say that market depth is nothing but the number of people who are giving different bids. No, market depth is nothing but the full view of the order book. Okay. okay, so here when you want to see the market depth, okay, you are right now you are only seeing the top of the book. Yes. The normal display is only the top of the book. Okay, the best bid and offer. So if you ask to see the market depth, that means you want to see at least the full view of the order book or some level of maybe uh, the five next best offers and five next best bids to some but as i told you that that is used to gain uh, an insight into which way huh? it doesn't create pressure it gives you a sense of which way uh, the market might be tilting because if you see the market depth and you see that there are many more buy orders the buy, because see the volumes here don't have to match 
Here the volumes don't have to match. If you see even here, I put 300 here, 300, but this is 200, this is 400. The volumes don't have to match. The price distances also don't have to match. So market depth only means that if I want to see the market depth, like many exchanges like NASDAQ doesn't give you market depth unless you pay some extra fee. So for all exchanges, you like NSE is giving you free data. Even on Google Finance, they're giving you free data to everybody. But some exchanges charge a fee. So like NASDAQ will charge a fee to get their live data. And if you want, and that fee is only covering only the top of the book. If you want to see NASDAQ market debt, you have to pay extra money per month. Okay, because that's more information. Clearly, if I show you only 68.99 against and the quantities for 68.99, that's one level of information. But if I show you the full order book, or at least if I show you five levels here and five levels here on top, okay, then I'm showing you more information. So I'll charge you more and more for that uh, information. Okay. So market depth is nothing but either it will refer to the full view of the order book, or you could say I I want to see market depth for the next five orders or the next 10 orders. So it'll show you the next five best bids, the next five best offers. Are you following? Parul is not convinced. What exactly is not clear? I think what you said that they will charge us. Yeah. But, uh, I think uh, they will charge us for that. We, uh, when we bid uh, in the display, they represent five best uh, bids and five for uh, best asks. I have paid it in its so no, no, that goes, that varies from exchange to exchange. NSE is not charging because NSE is not charging for even here. You guys can also see like here, but if you go right click on the particular share price, okay, on our IDC offer or IDC bid, and then you choose book and uh, choose trading analytics. If you see this here, okay, if we choose, if we right click on this, if I, if I got ITC here, I got the ask. If I right click and I go to trading tools, and I choose book trader it will launch but what anyway it won't launch because the internet is not there uh, it is launching wow that's amazing so you can see uh, that this is what you see here ITC if we can close this yeah but the information is not uh, proper because there's no connection but this is what you see okay here so this point what you're saying they're not charging this based on your experience at SMC that's because the NSC's policy is not to charge at this point of time NSC Privy they want to generate trading interest they are giving you the data for free but that doesn't mean that every exchange in the world is going to give you data for free okay so many exchanges like Nasdaq and many other exchanges CME group they will all charge fees they'll charge data fees because that data is their property the data is being generated from activity on their marketplace so if you want to see those pri live prices you need to pay a fee for that that is a pricing decision taken by NSE or by Nasdaq or CME group and NSE has taken a decision that okay we'll give the data for free but technically NSE is also within its rights to decide tomorrow that okay now we are going to start charging a fee okay is that clear it varies from exchange yeah sir uh, through this data a speculator uh, can make profit for example if i see that the uh, the there is a uh, more negative balance so i go there and i try to uh, sell my uh, sell the same thing and so that the price may drop and uh, yeah uh, yeah yeah so we can still use the mic or oh, that mic we can still use right or maybe i should use my that mic. anyway yeah it's okay i i understood this question now you give it to me <laughs> i'll use that mic because um, i mean everything today technologically it's a disaster so my question my was that it is not uh, not wrong that they are giving the data no, it's not a question of right or wrong okay what we are trying to make sure let's hope that everybody understands this clearly now i think this is not a problem so it's not a question of right or wrong okay this is just a question of this kind of data is theoretically available is technically available now the question is how will the exchange it's not clear here because the, the net connection is not there um, can't even close it actually We 
can't even go there because it's okay so uh, let's be clear about certain things one sec yeah so uh, this information that you see the order book information is everyone clear about the order book yes. it just shows you okay uh, the full view of if you get a full view of the order book okay if you use this expression I get a full view of the order book that means you're seeing able to see into the exchanges server and see all the buying interest and all the selling interest at different prices for different amounts okay some guy wants to buy 700 at 40 some guy wants to buy 460 okay and selling similarly on the selling side you can see all the interest that is shown by all the potential traders okay that you can see that's called the full view of the order book okay this is the order book now normally as we said you are only shown the top of the book which is the 68 and the 99 which is the best bid and offer okay so in the us you have this expression called national bid, 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 bid nbbo which is national best bid and offer which is connected to ideas of uh, best execution also when brokers when they are executing trades for customers they are also uh, they are subject to certain they are subject to certain standards so one of the things that they have to uh, ensure is that they uh, execute at the best bid and offer available because otherwise brokers can cheat you see suppose I am SMC and I am your broker and Parul gives me an order okay so I am SMC and Parul has given me an order to sell okay and many investors don't know what the actual market price is okay so the market price may be 68 the best bid okay 68 so technically I'm supposed to but what I do is I cheat her and I tell her that okay your trade is done at 65 and so I buy from her at 65 if I tell her that her trade is done at 65 means I have bought from her at 65 okay but in fact I go and immediately sell that same position which I bought from her at 68 and I make that money okay so in the days uh, you know uh, if in a market that is not so well regulated okay you may have these kinds of problems okay but then again it's a question is uh, if the customers trading a lot of customers trade who are not uh, well informed a lot of retail customers are not well informed okay so this doesn't mean necessarily that regulation is always a good thing because see you are supposed to make sure that you're well informed because if you if you don't have the full information and you're still trading in that market you should know that you you might get cheated right so like one of the reasons I don't trade in uh, stuff like Bitcoin and stuff is because there's a lot of uh, risk and then, then the regulatory uncertainty and stuff like that so you should only trade in markets where you have access to good information if you're not smart enough to do that I would say that uh, I'm not a big fan of regulation so I would say that you know if you if you are behaving in a stupid way then you you know in English there's a problem a fool and his money are soon parted you know that expression so some guy sends you an email from Nigeria I am to Sesuseko you win five million dollars please send thousand dollars processing fee and if you are such an idiot if you send the thousand dollars to him well you're a moron and you deserve to lose your money okay I don't think we should have regulation to protect stupid people from losing their money okay because you can never do that there will always be some stupid person who uh, you know he, he, who's gonna lose his money so anyway so this is a point that you have to understand this concept of best execution and generally most markets there is regulation to ensure that broker don't cheat customers like that okay so brokers have to ensure that they execute at the national at the national best bid and offer okay is that clear okay so order book is understood best bid and offer is understood okay the point uh, I, I drifted from and so the market depth once again to recap market depth is nothing but being able to see the full order book sometimes you might qualify market depth by saying that okay give me market depth only for the next five orders so the order book might contain a total of maybe 75 sell orders and 75 uh, or maybe 100 buy orders but you only want to see market depth for the next five best bids and offers so then you'll only see uh, above and beyond the above and below the best bid and best offer you'll only see the next five best bids and offers is this clear you can qualify that statement also but generally market depth if you don't qualify it means you want to see the whole mark uh, whole of the order book that is available for display is this clear coming back to his question what he's saying is that this information can be uh, used that's what I said it is used okay now I don't know whether we have uh, I don't think this is a good topic to discuss today when we don't have access to the notes okay wow we got here good so what Garvit has done unfortunately I can't move it I'll put these links into your uh, notes okay so there is what Garvit has actually hint, uh, hinted at is 
this concept of spoofing and layering okay so essentially what uh, partly uh, he's hinted at that so one of the things you can do is obviously that when you have an order book position or when you have an order book view like this you can see all the orders obviously you can't see anything here because the, the data feed is not live but essentially this uh, uh, if you imagine these are all the different prices and all the different prices you can see some amount that is being bid and offered at this price and let's say this is the pr uh, level here the best bid is 45 and the best bid is 50 i mean the best bid is 45 and the best offer is 50. we can imagine this this is where the market is right now okay best bid is 45 best offer is 50. this is where the market is imagine some quantities on either side and then you have a whole bunch of quantities uh, being offered at 55 60 75 this is not the best bid uh, this, these are not the best offers and then again below 45 you have a whole bunch of quantities being offered here so one of the things that uh, Garvin is saying is that you can use this information to uh, you know maybe make profit from this that is to uh, understand which way the buying price so if you see that there's uh, billions of dollars of sell orders very tightly packed okay but on the bid side you see very little volume well, remember the volumes don't have to be the same okay there's billions of dollars of selling interest but very little buying interest okay but maybe a few hundred shares or something being shown on the bikes so that shows you clearly that the market seems to have a lot of selling pressure in it okay at least from the order book shows a lot of selling pressure because there are so many people who want to sell billions of shares at these higher prices this is clear this is how you use the market so the people who use market depth are typically people like market makers okay or doing people who are trading at a high frequency who are very interested in short-term movement okay because this stuff if you see once you see an actual market once you see an actual order book okay a market depth view you will see how rapidly it's changing so this stuff is not going to be good for the next three days or anything like that this is like like next three minutes kind of thing so the time horizon is very short because it's changing all the time okay the picture will change rapidly in the next three minutes you can have a radically different picture so these are very short term horizon uh, tools okay so yeah you could see that that's what you were saying right so if you see that there's heavy uh, selling pressure in the uh, in the market depth you can see that there's tremendous selling interest then what you would do is you would try to sell ahead of that okay and try to drive and because you can see that the price is likely to go down so once you sell and then the other people also start selling then the price goes down and you make a profit from that okay so that's one way to use that obviously you use the market depth information to try and assess which way the short term movement is going to be up or down okay that's one the second is of course there's another kind of problem that you guys should be aware of there's also a case recently in the uh, okay so i think that's a different one that's a co-location case but the, this kind of uh, issue can also come up in indian markets that some people engage in what is called when people are getting restless i think i have only one minute left so i'll just introduce the idea of spoofing spoofing is essentially what you're doing is suppose the best bid is 45 best offer is 50. suppose i want to scare the market okay i'm actually a buyer i'm actually a buyer my intention really is to buy but what i will do is best offer is 50. i will show here 55 let's assume the next price is going to be 55. at 55 i'll put in a 20 billion dollar sell order okay so that will scare people okay people will think that actually i have no intention of selling i actually am a buyer i'll put in a 20 billion dollar sell order at 25 at, at 55 okay and that will scare some people maybe garvid will get scared and then he'll start selling his stuff his whatever he wanted to sell that will drive the price down and when it goes down then i'll come in with a i'll cancel this sell order and i'll come in with a big buy order and buy up the stuff okay so this is called spoofing okay this is something which uh, there's an indian trader who is now being convicted in the us for doing this in uh, some futures markets hmm? it's illegal yeah and most uh, in most markets it's illegal okay so there is one sec i better i have to stop this okay so yeah i'm answering tanya's question but the, the rest of you can whoever wants to needs to go out can go because uh, the classes will we'll stop the class okay so the class is dismissed but i'll answer tanya's question and if you have any other question yeah it's illegal in the sense that yeah most countries uh, in most countries it's illegal okay so the us that's what i was giving you this example of there's a guy called narendra sarao who is a indian origin uh, uk citizen who's been actually uh, you know i don't know if he's been convicted but he's been tried in the us for doing this in some futures contracts 
where he's engaged in spoofing and the people are saying the authorities are saying that you engaged in spoofing because he had an algorithm he actually had an algorithm yeah he had a program which actually uh, because it's a program so everything is written into the program that cancel the order so that's also written into the program if I'm doing it manually you can always say that no I never really had any plan to do that and you can't read my mind but because this, this is algorithmic trading that he was doing it's written into the program cancel the order place it show it and then cancel it so that's why he's being charged with spoofing so it's illegal in most markets yeah. okay any other technical question yeah what is that <laughs> what should I have for lunch or something like that okay. anything else a technical question yes yeah yeah so if it's tech related to the subject matter then I won't close the recording yeah yeah so actually I have to so I want to know uh, if I purchase one product and sell it, and sell it. So where it will be recorded in my account? Here, see, in, in in ID, what will happen is you have to go to the website. Okay. One is that you'll have a trade log. This will not open now. It is still open. Okay. At least some of the stuff is. Yeah. I want to see my uh, trade This is the IB. This is TWS. Okay. Now I don't know how to navigate this particular portal of SMC, but I'll tell you something. See, for here, for um, it's very small. You very small. You need to bring me a desk, bring a laptop or something. Very small. One minute. Let me just answer a question. Short answer is. You can see the trades in IB, you can see the trade. There'll be a trade log somewhere in the software. Okay, like this software gives you this trade log, right? You can you have this option of trade log. If you click that at any time, if you have been trading actively during the day, you'll see the trades for today. Okay, last two days, last three days, everything you can see. Okay. You'll see all the up, buy, sell, buy, sell, everything will be shown here. Okay. Another thing you can do is you can go to the interactive brokers website, okay, and you can see uh, you can log into your account account using the same ID and password okay there will be a uh, account management login if you go to the interactive brokers website you'll see account management login and there you'll see there's an option once you get in look for uh, statements okay activity I think they're called activity statements so you can request a daily statement or a monthly statement so that will show you all the trades for the month that's what you're looking for right historical record of what you've done yeah I don't know about the SMC software because I've not used it but the, any software should have some options for you yeah maybe they have a similar system where you log, log in through the website into account management or whatever yeah. so like you uh, said that uh, any market maker need to make some amount with, uh, with himself so that he can uh, maintain, uh, maintain some uh, amount with him so he can also create a false demand by uh, repurchasing from the repurchasing the share at a higher price and then reselling them like I uh, gave them a bit price of initially of yeah. 80 you use the mic yeah. So like initially suppose yeah we go back to the example of Tesla yeah we suppose 68.99 yeah 68 the bid is 68 and the market offer is 99, 99. yeah yeah I bid 68 use your mic use your, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm bidding at 68 and people are purchasing it but no people cannot purchase at your bid if you are bidding 68 people can only sell to you at that bid I'm asking them for the amount of 99 uh, like you said instead of 99 we can uh, also uh, give uh, people can purchase at 97 as well. If you lower your offer price, yeah, I lowered my offer. So let's the same market maker has 68 and 99. Okay, so you have lowered your offer now to 97. So now your price is 68, 97. Yes. So you you are visualizing someone buying at 97 or selling to you at some, 68? Uh, no, um, my question is regarding the portion where I have to maintain some amount with me. You don't have to maintain any amount. Uh, like if there's an excess demand, I need to maintain some amount with me as well. No, no, no. That's not required because all you need to maintain is a square book overall, okay, in the long run. Okay, so you start out square. If the first transaction is you are taken, that means you have gone short. Yeah. Okay, then keep on people keep on taking from you all the time. Then you are getting short. Your the short position is making bigger, becoming bigger and bigger. At some point, you have to trigger an alarm that I can't afford to have such a big short position. So you have to now start raising your bid. So in you will have to start raising your bid so that it becomes attractive for others to sell to you. 
and if they sell to you, it will reduce your short position. It will reduce my short position, and uh, I can also uh, use it. What is this? At the end for. I can also uh, go ahead uh, for, for uh, by creating a false demand. Also. What is false demand here? Like uh, I re uh, like right now I'm short of some shares, so I just re uh, purchase them. But they are in still demand, so uh, like uh, reselling them at a higher price. After purchasing them, like I sold initially at 97, then I bid okay. I uh, I'm pur uh, purchasing those shares from you at 70, and then reselling them at around 99 or 100. Yeah. So, uh, uh, can I do it uh, this way as well? Okay, you're saying that when you, what you're saying is that when you buy back your shares, yeah. the stuff you sold, say you sold five million and ninety-seven. Now you raise your bid from sixty-eight, you raise it to seventy for 70. five million. So somebody comes and sells you at seventy. Now you got five million. You're saying the fact that you raise the bid at seventy, now that will push the offer up also and market up yes. overall to us. That can happen. Depends on what else is happening around you what the other guys are doing so there is no clear cut because whatever you are doing you are taking a risk okay so even the guy who is coming and buying from you initially is taking a risk if he's a speculator he's just starting out and taking a position everyone's taking a risk so uh, for, even if you create a false demand if you do it you do it by buying but you still have the long position right if you buy extra beyond what you need to cover your short position you're buying extra then you are taking a risk because uh, you think you are creating a false demand but actually there may be waves of sellers coming from you don't know where so you don't know what the other guys are doing that's the problem so you can't easily uh, cheat people here because in a free market in a free market like people can come from all over and start putting bids and offers so you don't know what the other guys are doing this the, that's the biggest problem in trying to manipulate that's the biggest problem that you don't know what the other guys are doing that's why if you stick to liquid markets where many many people can come in and play your risk of getting hit by manipulation is less because people will be more afraid to manipulate in a market where there are very few players then they can get together and manipulate it's clear so false demand you will end up taking a risk so you can't get away from that okay. yeah sorry Tanya you had another question Tanya had another question is she here you had another question yeah what was the question the question was, the traditional speculators, yeah. how do they make money when the market is going down? They should have been able to see, they should have had that much foresight that uh, now that the class is over, I guess the internet connection will come back. But the point is that the same TCS, okay, if somebody has a view that it's going down actually, okay, then they would have sold. But then they have incurred some losses. Why? Because they would have, okay, they would have bought it at low price for the market low. No, no, no. If you are talking about directional speculator, then you don't start with the assumption that they have bought it. Because you are starting from a square book again. The first transaction is a sell or a buy, whatever. If you are saying that their view is. If they have a square book, how are they selling? Because they don't own it. Yeah, that is called short selling. Okay? So that is allowed. We haven't discussed the transaction type for short selling but you can sell you it can sell already you can you sell doing. without even what you don't have that which you don't have you can and sell buy later. and you can buy back later okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah.